I'm Simon, and yeah, I guess I don't have to repeat what you just said. And I'm here to present my work uh, together with Rachel Player, who's my PhD supervisor, and Hiroki Okada from KDDI Japan on our paper on homomorphic polynomial evaluation. I just basically assume, I, so first of all, everyone can see the screen share, I hope. Yeah. Oops, no, annotation was already disabled and I just accidentally enabled it here. Okay, very good. Yeah, so I'll assume, basically assume that everyone has a general understanding what HE or FHE is and what bootstrapping is, but I'll under, expect no, no knowledge of BFE or something. I'll mention, explain that when we come to it. So to begin with, I want to give a little bit little bit motivation. So we all, many of us know TFHE and it's absolutely great, but it doesn't give the best of performance in all situations. The, even though they're slightly older, the BGV, BFV family still is in some situations at least has better performance. Generally speaking, they have very different characteristics in, in BGV, BFV, plain text, uh, ciphertexts are usually very heavyweight and thus can encode a lot of data, can enable so-called parallelism via slots. I'll, I'll also explain later what that exactly means. And the plain text space of that scheme has a, has a lot of mathematical structure. Technically, TFHE ciphertexts also have the plain text space is also a ring and also a structure, but since we have to keep messages small in that case we can't use it mathematically so nicely so bgv bfb has very very different characteristics and a very different kind of structure which makes it very interesting and useful for some applications one case that i want to maybe mention is the this paper here very recent paper and basically what they did is use BFV bootstrapping to bootstrap a large amount of LWE ciphertexts. And bootstrapping an LWE ciphertext is exactly what TFHE does. So this is just one part of one paper in the line of work who tried to bootstrap many LWE ciphertexts at once in a TFHE-like setting, and hence also go to this and um, make use of this kind of parallelism for improved amortized performance. Yeah, so what I want to say here is that we should definitely also be interested in BGV BFV because it's, it certainly complements other FHE work at the moment. And from a more theoretical side, I think our work is also very interesting because it deals with polynomial evaluation in a very new setting. Polynomial evaluation itself is a very well studied topic. It's very important. Much HE work in general is about polynomial evaluation, but the setting that we encountered during BGV BFV bootstrapping is a setting that hasn't been studied before. And I think it is just beautiful from a mathematical point of view. Okay. So I hope this is sufficient motivation for investigating this line of solution, investigating BFV bootstrapping. It, uh, or There's already a lot of work on it. And so I will first give you a short introduction to BFV and explain a little bit how this work, the previous work and the state of the art look like, and then present our work. BFV, well, I think it's, first of all, BFV and BGV are two different crypto systems, but they behave very similarly. In this talk, I'll talk about BFV only, but almost everything I say can also hold for BGV. BFV is an FHE scheme. Its plaintext ring space is a ring modulo, the so-called plaintext modulus T. The ciphertext space is basically the ring modulo, the ciphertext modulus Q, but we need two elements from RQ. So technically the ciphertext space is RQ square. And the secret element is also in RQ. And yeah, 
the central point here is the ring R. We use usually use cyclotomic rings, so the ring of integers in a cyclotomic number field. And one of the most popular choices is the is a cycl power of two cyclotomic number field. And it looks, so R, in this case, R looks like this. In fact, which cyclotomic number field to choose exactly, it's not a highly non-trivial discussion, but at least in the FHE standards, they have, I think, standardized power of two cyclotomic number fields. So they are certainly an important case. And we will, in this work, we will again only focus on these power of two cyclotomic number fields. In particular, we require here that capital N is a power of two, and then it looks like this here. Okay, um, BFV, I won't tell you exactly how the whole BFV scheme looks like, but we have to know that if we have a ciphertext, which consists of two elements, C0 and C1 in RQ, then basically we say it encrypts a message M if this identity here holds approximately. It won't hold exactly because we have to add a noise term to ensure security. And of course, as with all, all most, all lattice-based FHE schemes, this noise term will increase during homomorphic operations. And that's why we need bootstrapping. Yeah, exactly. I already mentioned, I won't tell you how the homomorphic operations look like. We can do addition, multiplication, and Galois automorphisms on encrypted data. You won't have to know how they work. We just have to, we we'll, we'll just use that, that, that we can compute them. Okay, I, th I think we keep most questions till the end, but if anyone has a question on on the working of BFV, I think it might be better to ask that now because otherwise you won't be able to follow the talk. No? Okay, then let's go on to bootstrapping. Again, as I already mentioned, we have this noise term. So this identity here only holds approximately, so up to a term that isn't something small, and it will increase during homomorphic operations. So at some point, it might be too large to decrypt correctly. That means we have to need a way to keep it small during computations. And the general way to do it is the bootstrapping as introduced by Gentry. <laughs> and it relies on homomorphically evaluating the decryption function or the decryption. OK. Um, this is not the general setting, but I'll soon explain that we can assume this in the bootstrapping context, that our plain text space is a prime and the ciphertext modulus is the power, a power of the prime. And in fact, we can choose this exponent e here to be relatively small. So in practice, it might be two or three. And p is a, usually also a small prime like 257. And then you can, I think, it's not too hard to see from this formula here, from our characterization of encrypting a message to, um, to derive this decryption formula here. Basically, we evaluate C0 plus C1S and then scale by T over Q. And if T and Q have the shape here, it's just division by P to the E minus one. And to remove the error, we round at the end. And if the error is small enough and E large enough, this works. Since we can do homomorphic addition and multiplication, it is relatively easy to compute uh, this part here. So C0 plus C1S, that's just one multiplication and one addition. We can easily compute this. The difficulty of bootstrapping is thus the, the rounded division by P to the E minus one. And in fact, most of the work on bootstrapping basically thinks about how we can do that efficiently. The state of the art is to express the rounded division by a floor division. Basically, they're equivalent if you add or subtract uh, half the divisor before. And in fact, the floor division in our setting can be achieved by a procedure that retrieves the least significant p-adic digit of a value. 
Why is that? Because I didn't tell you before, but it's possible by the structure of BFV to perform an exact division homomorphically. So we can divide by P homomorphically, but only if the value, encrypted value, is divisible by P. Otherwise, this will immediately cause a noise overflow. However, we can, if we want to compute the floor division, we can take the value, subtract the least significant p addict digit, and then, since we basically set the least significant p addict digit to zero that way, this means that the result will be divisible by p, and we can divide by p. And this will then compute the floor division by p, and repeating that procedure, we can thus do the whole, whole decryption. Yeah, I think, don't know, I went over this pretty quickly. It's also not fundamental to our work. It's just more like a motivation because we will now look at a method to get the least significant p addict digit. This was originally, the annotations don't vanish, okay. Yeah, good. Uh, this was originally done by the so-called lifting polynomials proposed by Halevi and Shu for HELAB, and they are characterized by this theorem here. And since it is somewhat, um, I guess, very formal, I've got a picture here. So we take our polynomial. This theorem says we, there exists a polynomial, F, and this polynomial is usually called lifting polynomial with this property here. And if we compile this property, assume we have a we, we have a value in set mod p to the five, then we can write it in the p addict representation as something times p to the zero plus something to, times p to the one and so on. So each square here represents a p addict digit. And now we set the last digit to be set zero and all the other digits together to be set one. And we set i to be zero, uh, to be one, sorry, i to be one. Then this statement here says that if we apply p, the result is congruent to z zero modulo p to the two because i equals one. That means applying f, the lifting polynomial to this picture here gives us basically this picture. It is congruent to set zero modulo p square. So we shift it in a zero here again. And if you do the same, but setting e for i, i equals two, and well, you set one prime now, we can apply f again, get this, and applying f two more times, we arrive at this value, which is our result, which is just the lowest p attic digit. Exactly. So this means everything we have to do during bootstrapping is evaluating, evaluate those lifting polynomials to extract the lowest digit. In total, the bootstrapping then looks like this. So we get an input ciphertext encrypting some message M. And yeah, here, this is the step I skipped in front. So we have some ciphertext modulus and we can do a modulus switch to switch it to the ciphertext modulus P to the E because we need that to work with this digit extraction. Then we compute here using an encryption of the secret key. Uh, this noisy, noisy decryption, this just which is very simple, just one multiplication and one addition. And now the problem is that if you look at this theorem here again, all our values are in set. So set zero, set one are in Z, and F is also in Z. But the plain text space of BFV is much more complicated. Um, namely, it's our ring here. That means if we, if we compute this noisy decryption here, we get some element in our ring and we can basically write it as a sum m tilde i x i, where m tilde i here are well, values in set p or in, in set whatever you want. And to perform the digit extraction step, we can only do the digit extraction on scalars, so on, on each mi tilde separately, but not on the whole value. So we basically, we have to take this one element here apart into many elements. 
And this taking apart is usually considered uh, to uh, defined to be the linear transformation. Computing this homomorphically is, is highly non-trivial, but I won't talk about it in this work at all because we use exactly the same linear transformation as in previous work. Yeah, after the, the linear transformation, we have each noisy coefficient here in a separate ciphertext. And then we can perform the digit extraction, which is just evaluating the lifting polynomial multiple times. And afterwards, we get the Ms without the error, and we can combine them back using an, the inverse linear transformation to, again, to an encryption of the original message. And that then is the bootstrapped result. Yeah, any, any questions still here? There's one question in the, the chat. Um, uh, the range of the prime numbers, well, P could be 257 or prime for the same amount. Q, uh, well, it doesn't really matter how large it is. I think it can be up to like 800 bytes or something. Um, but it doesn't really matter because we don't care about Q. We immediately do the modulus switch and then we consider work in P to the E, and E is very small, like one or two. So this space here is much smaller than this here. What is the linear transformation? Yeah, I think I am... Honestly, we can talk about it afterwards. It's not so simple. It's a non-trivial algorithm, and I don't... I think it will go beyond the scope of the presentation now to explain that. Any other questions? Yeah. I guess that, that's it then, unless, yeah. I think, I hope you all got a basic idea of what bootstrapping is. You don't have to know the details because what we're really working on from now on is just the evaluation of the lifting polynomial. Okay, uh, now, I'm sorry, we'll need some algebraic number theory. So be careful, even though Mathematician might say calling this algebraic number theory is a little bit saturated, but yeah. We call, I already promised you at the beginning that I call about slots and parallelism. Basically, this here is the slide of that topic. Our plain text space is the our, again our cyclotomic ring modulo T, and you can also write it like this here. Uh, basically, as a cro polynomial quotient ring over set T. And while x to the n plus 1, for a power of 2n, of course, is irreducible in over set, it can factor modulo t. And whether it does or not, and how it does, that depends on t, mainly. Also on n, of course. And if it factors, we can use the Chinese remainder theorem to find a ring isomorphism between rt, or plain text space, and, a, and basically these rings here, where the fi's are the factors of, of uh, x to the n plus 1. And in fact, our number field here is, is Galois. And that means that the Galois automorphisms of that number field, they give us isomorphisms between the different slots. This means all these slot rings here are isomorphic. In other words, our plain text space might decom can decompose as, a, as many copies of the same ring. And this ring is like the slot ring. And now if we encrypt, if we, we can put different values in each of these slots, and if we perform an operation, a homomorphic operation on them, this basically performs the homomorphic operation on each slot separately. In other words, it gives us single instruction, multiple data parallelism. We perform one homomorphic operation, and it will be done on each, on the data contained in each slot. And yeah, this is very useful and one of the main reasons why BFE has, has good performance. In particular, we can use it for bootstrapping. So here again, as a reminder, our plain text space decrypts as slots and basically we can encrypt a vector where that, which has elements in each slot. Yeah, so we set the slot number, the number of slots to be small n. Yeah, and that means we can now, if we go back to the bootstrapping here, here we had had to perform the digital extraction step capital N times. 
but in fact, by we can do small n digit extractions at the same time by encoding the corresponding noisy coefficients into slots. This means we have to only perform the digit extraction step in total n, capital N over small n step times. And now the natural question is, well, why do we not set small n equals capital N? Because that would, of course, give us optimal performance. We only had to perform a single digit extraction step. And the answer is, well, sometimes we can, but it, there are restrictions on the parameters. In particular, small n equals capital N would mean that our cyclotomic polynomial factors completely modulo p. And this is equivalent uh, that, or modulo t, and if t is a prime, we assume that t is a prime p. This is equivalent to p is congruent to 1 modulo 2n. So in particular, p must be greater than 2n, because p clearly can't be 1. And n can be up to the range of 30,000. In other words, we certainly can't use a prime like 257. And large and generally, but we would like to take a small p. Why? Well, for example, the plaintix modulus has a the larger it is, the larger the noise growth is during homomorphic operations. Also, if we go back, you can see that the lifting polynomial has degree up to p. So a large p would mean we have to evaluate a large degree polynomial. So this is a trade-off here. It, and it's really not 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 quite clear how large we can choose p, how large we can choose small n, but generally speaking, we don't want n equals capital N. Yeah, and this is now where our, where our verb comes in, because our plain text slots look like this, and okay, a short reminder for now, um, while our plain text slots look like this, in practice, we, you can think for now that E equals one. It won't be, but this would mean that our plain text slots are just finite fields. And I guess we are all more familiar with finite fields than with these rings here. And in fact, if you work out the math, it will be exactly, exactly the same. So I present the theory in the case of finite fields here. And later using Hansel's lemma, basically you can show that the theory works exactly the same way. In, in, our, in the real plain text slots. Yeah, and the point is now that the rank here, so D, the algebraic rank of our plain text slots is larger the smaller n is. So by our decomposition, uh, we see that if n is small, each of the slots must have large rank. And if n is large, each of the slots must have small rank. Particular if n equals capital N, this means each slot has already ranked one, but right? basically each slot would be FP. But since we don't want to choose small n equals capital N, we'll get slots of higher algebraic rank. So FP to the D with D greater one. On the other hand, I already mentioned that, uh, that the digit extraction only works in set, or if we reduce it modulo P in FP. That means our homomorphic operations perform arithmetic in FP to the D, but we only really use the part in FP. We only store values that are in FP. And so this basically means we raise the rest of the field. And I think this is a very interesting setting because in practice, it's usually the other way around. In practice, you're very happy in, not in practice, sorry, in other situations that have nothing to do with FHE. You would usually be very happy if you only have to work in FP because our standard arithmetic in FP is fast. And you're very unhappy if you have to go to FP to the D because computing in there is expensive. But in our setting, we basically only have to work in FP, but we get the whole of FP to the D for free. And the question is, can we use this arithmetic in FP to the D to get to speed up our evaluation of the lifting polynomials? Yeah. Now a short introduction. I already mentioned uh, Galois automorphisms many times. 
but here a few more information. The Galois automorphisms are in this case, in the case of one plain text slot, just the automorphisms of the field of P to the D. They form a group, which is clear you can just combine automorphisms. And this group is cyclic, namely it is generated by the Frobenius automorphisms, a pi, which we will denote by pi. Yeah, and of course, um, since we won't be in the finite field case, but in like a, a ring of characteristic P to the E instead, we have to know that this whole thing also works in the real case, but it, in fact, it does. It, it doesn't look as simple as here. The Frobenius automorphism in that case is more complicated, but it exists and it basically behaves the same. And for those who like an algebraic number theory, the whole like decomposition into slots and the action of the Galois group on the slots and so on is, is a result of the splitting behavior of the prime idea generated by the prime P in the cyclotomic number field. But I guess it's not really relevant, just as I need. Mainly what we will know, need is that the Galois, Galois group is generated by the Frobenius automorphism. A further notion we borrowed from algebraic number theory is the norm. The norm exists in basically every any Galois field extension. In fact, in any field extension, but it only has this nice shape in Galois field extensions. And in our case, it will be the product over all Galois automorphisms applied to X. So the norm of X is, is this product here. And since pi, the Frobenius automorphism generates the Galois group, we can write it like this. And the first observation is that the norm of a value is equal to the constant coefficient in its minimal polynomial. And if you do the math, like pull through, you can derive this, this equation here. Basically, if you take an element in the whole field in fp to the d, an element alpha, and then an element in the prime field, just in fp, you can compute that the norm of alpha minus x is equal to the minimal polynomial of alpha evaluated at x. And in fact, this here basically already gives us the math that we need to switch between, to go from our prime field where we have to, where we want to work in, to the whole field which we get like, which you can use to speed up things. And the second observation, uh, is that we can compute this norm efficiently, homomorphically. The, the standard way to compute this product would, of course, take d multiplications, homomorphic multiplications, or rather d minus 1, because the product has d factors. But in fact, the norm has some kind of functional factorization. And I think the most intuitive way to explain, this is, explain it is by some kind of recursive algorithm. So if we want to compute the norm of x, we can basically start with x. Then we set x1 as x0 times pi of x0. And yeah, this is, of course, x times pi of x. x2 as x1 times pi square of x1. And now if you insert it, if you insert, plug in the definition of x1 and the fact that pi is a ring automorphism, hence commutes with multiplication, we find that this has or is already the product over all over all the powers of pi up to three. And in fact, if you continue like this and set xi plus one to be xi times pi two to two to the i times x of xi, then you'll get that this is already all the powers of pi up to two to the i plus one. In other words, if we continue this here to x to the log d, that is already the norm. So we can compute this norm here homomorphically using only logarithmic log d multipli homomorphic multiplications and log d applications of the Frobenius. This, this factoriza functional factorization has also been known before. I've never seen it applied in, for the norm, but the norm has a sibling, which is the trace. Basically, it's exactly the same if you replace the product by a sum, which, and the trace has already been used a lot in literature, and they usually use this kind of functional factorization 
as well to compute the trace efficiently. We will do it for the moment. Okay. If you stare a little bit at these two observations, I think it's it's uh, it's it already seems quite believable that we can indeed speed up polynomial evaluation using this method. In particular, I've got the two observation here. If we find an alpha in fp to the d such that the minimal polynomial of alpha is exactly the digit extraction polynomial, the polynomial that we want to evaluate, then we can of course use observation one to reduce the evaluation of the digit extraction polynomial to a computation of the norm and compute the norm efficiently using observation two. Okay, now the question is, when does such an alpha exist? It's, that can be relatively easily characterized by number theory. It certainly requires that P is at most D. Why that? Well, because the minimal polynomial had, has at most degree D and the digit extraction polynomial has degree P, as we know. So if this is the case and we can find such an alpha, and in fact, we argue in our paper that this here is like almost sufficient. There are cases where it's not sufficient, but mostly it will, will be the case. Like you can, in many cases, it, this alpha exists and in fact it exists in the cases, in cases that are practically relevant. Oh, and so in these cases, we can then compute the digit extraction polynomial in logarithmic, logarithm of P multiplications. And as a comparison, before they only used the patterson stockmeyer method, which uses two square P multiplications. So it's significantly slower. As an interesting side fact, the patterson stockmeyer method it can be shown to be even optimal for a generic polynomial if you don't have Galois automorphisms available, but just addition and multiplication. But in our case, we do have Galois automorphisms, so we can do better. And also, you don't have to apply the whole thing for the digit extraction polynomial, but we can use it in all settings where, where we basically have a fp to the d as a slot, and we only want to, and the points where we want to evaluate are all scalar, like an fp. So this is not just applicable for bootstrapping, but could be applicable for many other computa homomorphic computations. Still, bootstrapping seems to be the like most interesting one. Okay, so I uh, guess we here really is the question now. It seems to work in theory. What about in practice? I already mentioned that we found alphas for practical cases that allow this. And in fact, the like nicest case is this year, where n is about thirty thousand to the to the two to the fifteen. P is 257, a very nice prime that gives us gives us a good trade-off between number of slots and size of P. This uh, this will give us namely 128 slots, and each slot has algebraic rank 256. And we can set E equals 2. And then we implemented the whole thing based on zeal. And yeah, these are these are basically the timings here. Um, I also report the timings for the linear transformations, even though we didn't change them at all, basically, but they, as you can see, they take a significant amount of runtime as well. Okay, um, so I think there are multiple things on the slide I should note uh, note, uh, note on. So first of all, we say we only use log logarithm of p multiplications, but in fact, the performance depends on mainly on key switches. Multiplications cause key switches, but also automorphisms cause key switches. This means, and since we, for our efficient implementation here, this year we need log D multiplications and log D automorphisms. So basically the number of key switches will be two times logarithm of P and logarithm of P is about eight. So we are about seven, about six, two times eight, 16. 17 in this case. The other problem 
Or maybe maybe I'll ask, can anyone spot another like problem with this? With this slide. Okay, then I will tell you. Here I assume P is bounded by D, but in fact P is one larger than D. And yeah, um this is just a result of the fact that these parameters seem to work nicely. And yeah, I, I won't tell exactly how we did it. Basically, we like fiddled around. You can reduce the degree of the digital extraction polynomial by one, evaluate it, and then do some correction afterwards. And that's also why we need like one additional key switch for this case. But it, this is more like an implementation detail and doesn't fundamentally obstruct our problem. Obstruct our yeah, theory. So in fact, it, you can make it work. And in the end, we are basically like so significantly faster than previous implementation. It's in particular, this Chen Han paper here. What about, uh, I'll mention future work in a, in a second or, sorry, not future work, parallel work or recent, more recent work on BFV bootstrapping. Talk about that later. Um, yeah, I think this speed up, it doesn't look so impressive, but in, if you consider that we basically didn't change the linear transforms at all, this means we significantly improved the digital extraction step really. really. Okay. Yeah, um, I think that's already our main result. There is, we did some more stuff. We also analyzed the trace in the paper and found a slightly more complicated, slightly slower method that can also evaluate polynomials using the trace. But since it's slower, we didn't really present it here. Although it might have some advantages in edge cases. But for that, I either ask me afterwards or refer to the paper. Okay, finally, I want to talk a little bit about recent work and future directions. So the first case is, in this work, we assumed that the prime uh, plain text modulus T is just a prime, but in fact, it, you know, the cases might be interesting where it's a prime power. Um, and in fact, these situations have been considered by other work. The main complication of this situation is that well, the lifting polynomials given by this theorem here, they still work, but they're suboptimal. Like you can find better things than these lifting polynomials here. And how these better polynomials look like has been studied by Chen Han and then by Gilin et al. later. And then, yeah, basically we didn't want to, our, our techniques are in theory can be combined with their techniques and these more polynomials but we didn't want to implement all of these new polynomials because in fact the work, there's quite a lot of complexity in their work as well. And yeah, it seemed simpler to first implement a proof of concept for the simple case. Exactly, but yeah, combining these methods would thus be definitely something that could be done in the future. Another interesting situation is also related to the first point, if we want to evaluate multiple polynomials in the same point. If the number of polynomials is equal to the degree of the polynomials, this, the fastest way will certainly be just evaluate all monomials, x1, x2, x3, and so on, to xn. And then each polynomial is just a linear combination of those. So you can do it with n multiplications or degree multiplications. In this case, Galois automorphisms obviously won't help. But if the number of polynomials is still like larger than one, but smaller, significantly smaller than the degree, then in fact, you, there might be ways how you can use Galois structure again. This is partly solved by the method of using the trace that I mentioned, but not completely. And the last point I want to mention is if we go back, if P is not smaller D, well, in the case that P is one larger than D or say a very, very small amount larger than D, this still works. But if P is significantly larger than D, then what can we do in this case? So we probably won't achieve logarithmic number of multiplications anymore, but possibly we could do better than Patterson-Stockmeyer. 
I, personally, I think in this situation, you would get somehow, the question is really, can we make a hybrid of Galois techniques together with Patterson Stockmeyer? Can we somehow combine this? Yeah, that's the, also, don't know how the solution to that would look like at the moment. And I think that's my work. I hope I, um, wow, 45 minutes on the minute. That's great. Uh, I'm really thank you for your attention and I'm very open to questions. <laughs>